Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for having me in part of the of this instruction course. Uh, so we all know the importance of gonioscopy and it being a gold standard. Obviously, in a patient to uh, of a glaucoma, you can't afford to uh, not to do a gonioscopy. The reason being because it allows you to view the actual site of impedance of the aqueous outflow, and also helps you to uh, detect mechanisms which are responsible for secondary glaucomas. The important thing is it has to be repeated periodically to detect emergence of additional mechanisms. Okay, so this is how a normal angle anatomy would appear. So from anterior to posterior, the shawl base line is the first structure you need to identify, followed by the trabecular meshwork, then the scleral spur, ciliary body band, and the iris root. So uh, whenever you do a gonioscopy, you need to first uh, answer certain questions because that will help you in detecting whether the patient has an open angle or a closed angle. So these are the questions which you need to answer. So uh, whenever you want to answer whether the angle is occludable or not, first you have to dim the room lights and see to it that the slit beam does not cross the pupil because that will cause artificial constriction of the pupil and a closed angle might appear open. And hence you do what is known as a corneal wedge test. So when the slit beam is focused into the angle structures, the slit beam gets divided into an epithelial beam and an endothelial beam. Okay, and it comes to a focus at the Schwalbe's line. This is where the Desmet's membrane is uh, located of the cornea. Okay, and once you identify the structures, and then you can grade the deeper structures. So this is a corneal wedge test, which it has to be performed to uh, grade the angle structures. Uh, so then according to what angle structures you see, you can grade it as per whatever grading you prefer. Uh, once uh, you have diagnosed that it's a uh, closed angle or an occludable angle, you have to just do the step of indentation glomerulonephropathy because this will help you determine whether it's an oppositional closure or a sinical angle closure. And this is possible only with a four mirror glomerulonephropathy. After that, you increase the illumination, let the pupil constrict so that you can look at the deeper structures and identify any additional mechanisms which could be adding to the secondary glaucoma. Also, you need to look at the peripheral iris. So this is how a normal regular curvature is of the iris is seen. If it's a bit convex, it could be a pupillary block glaucoma. If it's a concave thing, usually seen in either pigmentary glaucoma, AFK glaucomas. Also, the incision of iris, especially in uh, juvenile glaucomas, they, you will see there's more of an anterior incision of the peripheral iris. So, gonioscopy is not only essential for diagnostic, but it is also used for therapeutic purposes. Let's go through certain clinical examples. This is how a wide open angle or a primary open angle glaucoma uh, gonio would appear as. And this is how a narrow angle or a occludable angle. Now, you might mistaken this area as to be the trabecular measure because of pigmentation, but it's only when you do indentation, you realize the entire lens diaphragm moves backwards and you'll see the sinical angle closure and the trabecular meshwork is located here. Okay, and hence the importance of indentation gonioscopy. After you've done an iridotomy, okay, and uh, uh, you overcome the pupillary block, you will see probably the sine wave sign, and this indicates a plateau iris. Uh, this is how angle structure would appear in a developmental glaucoma. Okay, this is basically to show you difference. These are uh, iris processes. These are normal iris processes, and they are fine fibril-like structures from the stroma of the iris along the concavity. And uh, to compare it with the sinica, sinica would be broad based and there will be peripheral pulling up of the iris. Uh, Neovascular glaucoma, you might uh, miss out on the pupillary margins, the rubiosis. It's only on gonioscopy, you might see the arborization, which is extending over the trabecular mesh. This is how a fibrovascular ingrowth would appear. Okay, sometimes uh, when the tumor of a ciliary body uh, penetrates deeper into the angle structure, you might see as a peripheral anterior sinica out there. This is how a pigmentary glaucoma would appear. You can see the trabecular pressure pigmentation with the sample is his line. Pseudo exfoliation in the angle structures also can be seen. Uh, post cataract surgery you could have vitreous loss causing increased pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork and inflammation of the trabecular meshwork because of the vitreous. Uh, old generation anti chamber lenses could cause complete sinical angle closure. Post phaco, if an epinucleus piece is left behind, uh, that could cause intermittent uh, uveitis and uh, glaucoma. This is how an angle recession glaucoma would appear. You can see the white ciliary body band. Okay, in a uveitic glaucoma, you will see gonioscinicae, but it's so different from an angle closure because you can see the wide open angles in between. Silicon oil glaucoma, post trabeculectomy also sometimes gonioscopy helps you, especially if the pressure starts rising immediate post operatively. You see the peaking of pupil, and when you do a gonioscopy, you will realize it's a peripheral iris which is obstructing the internal ostium. Sometimes there could be vitreous incarceration also in the ostium. 
This could be a rare condition where a patient has undergone a small incision cataract surgery, developing a pseudo bleb, and it's only on gonioscopy you'll realize is the fish mouthing of the wound, which is causing the pseudo bleb to appear. However, though being a gold standard, there are certain limitations, like in any technique, less reproducibility, errors which are induced by the technique because of the light conditions. Sometimes you may not be able to visualize the angle structures properly. And because of uh, the corneal indentation, the folds might cause the vision, uh, the angle structures, uh, again, not to be visualized clearly. Also, the inability of the, uh, to visualize structures which are posterior to the iris. Okay, And hence, you could miss out on certain features and certain of the certain conditions. For example, in plateau iris, you might not be able to see, obviously, the absence of the ciliary sulcus or the medial rotation of the ciliary processes. In a malignant glaucoma, because the anterior chamber is already very shallow, you won't be able to do the gonioscopy. It's only basically you have to use other uh, modalities, imaging modalities to diagnose. A supraciliary effusion causing a leading to angle closure, causing a shallow chamber. And again, you might miss out on the supraciliary effusion because you can't see uh, with a gonioscopy what's beyond the iris. An iris cyst might appear as a pupillary block glaucoma. It's only when you do these imaging technologies, you will be able to see and diagnose an iris cyst. Sometimes uh, malpositioned intraocular lenses causing a UGH syndrome. And because the uh, uh, haptic would be constantly irritating the ciliary body or the iris causing UGH. Uh, this can be detected only on imaging technologies. Post-trauma, you could have a supraciliary uh, effusion or a uh, cleft, and which again cannot be seen by a gonioscopy. Uh, quantitative angle analysis, especially if you want to do research and also uh, you want to do the dark room test and you want to evaluate uh, based on this, it is not possible doing a gonioscopy. So gonioscopy is mandatory for the diagnosis and management of glaucoma. Also evaluation of the internal ostium in the post trabeculectomy period and also in diagnosing certain non glaucomatous conditions such as inadvertent blebs. But it too has its limitations and hence that's where the role of imaging uh, devices uh, comes into play. Thank you.